Hey guys, this is a coding session where we'll build a basic clone of the Google Calendar using just vanilla JavaScript. We'll discuss some of the basic programming concepts you should know when starting such a project, we'll take a look at the powerful things we can achieve with just JavaScript, and I'll probably rant a bit about the current state of the whole JavaScript ecosystem. We'll go through the whole development process together, and by the end of this video, you should feel comfortable enough working directly with the DOM, and feel more confident about building interactive apps without the help of third-party libraries. Let's jump right into it, and start working on some of the code. There are two external dependencies I'll use in the project. The first one is Prettier, which is a basic code for and we'll discuss it in detail a bit later. The second one is Vite, which will provide an easy to use development environment and some basic front end tooling to go through the project setup quickly. The installation wizard is pretty self explanatory, and as long as you have an up to date node version, you should end up with a default project ready to run in no time. As a quick FYI, I'm using the VS Code ID in this example since it is a powerful tool considering it is free. Let's begin by doing a bit of cleanup. I'm creating a source folder for the JavaScript files and the styles folder for our styling rules. In most projects, you'll end up with subfolders under the source directory. For instance, you'd want to group all your components under a component directory or all your specific REST calls to an API directory. This makes perfect sense, but my advice to you is to only do this when the project grows in size. Always use the most basic project structure and then update it accordingly when the project grows and the structure needs are clear. The main.js file is the entry point in our app. If you were to use a UI library such as Velt or Solid, this is where you would mount your app into the DOM. Since we are doing it all ourselves, we'll work on the JS code needed to populate our UI and handle any event interaction needed. First, however, let's take a quick detour and discuss briefly about styling. I will be using plain CSS in this project, even though I'm a big SAS fan for reasons you can find out in the video I'm linking into the top right corner. CSS is a bit of a dark ship in the front end space, and people came up with a lot of tools such as Tailwind and preprocessors like SAS aimed to make your life easier. In all fairness, a lot of cool new features were added into CSS in the last few years, and there is an argument to be made that the language is mature enough now to be reliably used on its own in any type of project. Styling is not really a topic for this video, so we'll not get into any details, but you can check out the entire implementation in the GitHub project linked in the description. Back to our JavaScript code, in all single page apps, you'll need some sort of mechanism to handle state, which is a fancy word for saying where do you store the app data and how the UI components can reliably use or update that data. You are probably familiar with state manager solution based on the flux pattern for instance. In our case, we'll just create a state object which will act as the single point of truth for all components interacting with the data. We'll be able to perform updates and, in just a couple of minutes, we'll also implement a basic publisher subscriber class to allow independent components to be notified when the data changes. We'll store a reference of the app DOM element in our state object for later usage, and then we'll work on the first UI component, the header. UI components will render and keep the DOM up to date. There is an entire saga of people looking for the best approach to efficiently work with the DOM. We went through directly updating the DOM with jQuery, to dirty checking in AngularJS, to the virtual DOM with React, and now we are back to directly performing DOM operations with Solid and Svelte. The reality of 2022 is that working with the DOM is fast enough for most use cases and will do just that. Don't get me wrong, I believe that all the headaches we've gone through in the past 10 years in the front-end space were more than necessary in order to push the browser capabilities, the JavaScript language and the third-party space forward. I'm not one of those guys that believes that anything can be done with vanilla JS and that there are too many frameworks out there. Actually, for any real-world project, I'm the first one to impose TypeScript in any codebase, and I'm actually considering picking Solid as my React replacement for any new project. Using the backticks, I define the template literal with the DOM elements needed in our header. I am keeping the structure as clean and as simple as possible. Next, in the init method, I will append the template to the app element we stored a bit earlier in the state object. Note that I'm using the insert adjacent HTML method to make sure I'm not removing anything already existing in the DOM. We will register event listeners all over the app, and we need to make sure that the elements we link the listeners to will not be replaced in the DOM. There are multiple buttons and links the user can interact with in the header. We could register an independent click listener for each element in part. This is the approach you would take with a UI library, where we can very easily match an event to an element in the template. Since we are managing our own events and handlers, we have a bit more flexibility and I'm registering a click handler directly in the header element. Then, internally, using some basic switch logic and the event target, I can decide what action to call. 
workload. This is extremely flexible, but it should also be clear to you that it isn't really scalable with large dev teams. The main advantage of using a UI library is that everybody pretty much agrees on the set of rules the library or framework imposes. In our case, a new developer could join my team, take a look at the code and decide that it's better to add any new event listener directly at the element level. And just like that, technical depth starts to creep in. With most of the header implementation out of the way, it's time now to spend some time on the actual calendar functionality. This is where we'll do most of our work. We'll start by making sure that the calendar grid view is displayed correctly based on the selected month, then we'll work on a feature that allows users to add events in the calendar. Finally, we'll implement a basic drag and drop functionality from scratch. Of course, all this will be integrated with the header buttons we just worked on. I defined a basic template which is added to the DOM. Compared to the header component, the content of the calendar can be changed dynamically, so we will build all that in real time based on the user's interactions. I am updating the state object structure to also keep track of some of the basic calendar data. We'll store the actual DOM element, the calendar view which could be a month view or a week view for instance, the calendar date being displayed and a couple of helper properties. The set date is a function which can be called from anywhere in the app to update the calendar view. The more interesting property here is the on date change pub sub object. To give you a concrete use case of this property, think about the user changing the month of the calendar. In this case, the header component, which is completely independent from the calendar state, needs to know to update the August 22 label to something else. With a front-end library, you'd have access to a mechanism such as the React effects or the Angular observables to monitor and react to changes in an elegant manner. In our case, I'm building a very basic PubSub object, which will allow us to do the bare minimum necessary for our situation. Note that this is a pretty naive implementation. If this was a real project, you would need to assign some IDs to your subscriptions and provide an unsubscribe mechanism to avoid memory leaks. As a quick side note, I am using the dollar sign at the beginning of a variable name to clarify that this value holds a DOM element, then I am using the dollar sign at the end of a variable name to represent that this entity is some sort of observable value. The calendar contents will be dynamically generated based on the active date and will do all this work in a function called updateView. Before moving forward however, we'll quickly add some date utilities to simplify our work with years, months and and dates. I will not spend too much time on the dates.js file since the code in here is not that complicated. It's worth mentioning though that there are tons of third-party libraries which will simplify your work with dates in JavaScript so you don't really need to jump through all these hoops in a real project. There are some things you need to pay attention to when working with dates like the side effects caused by the object mutability or the month index starting with 0 while days starting with 1 but these are things that you will rarely run into in real life scenarios. Back in the calendar file we are now ready to work on the actual UI and dynamically populate the DOM with the calendar cells and later with user created events. We'll need both the current month and year and the calendar state month and year since I want to outline with a different color the current date in the calendar. If it isn't clear, the calendar can have a different active date and month based on the user's interaction with it. In the header, we added the navigation buttons which allows you to skip through months and the today button which allows you to immediately come back to the current date and month. As I already mentioned, we'll do all this rendering manually by simply concatenating templates literals together. You would rarely do this in a real life project since existing UI libraries offer templating and JSX to simplify this process. There are however projects and use cases where for various reasons you need to roll up your sleeves and work with the DOM directly. I am fetching the number of days in the active month which of course could be either 28, 29, 30 or 31. Then in a for loop I am simply adding calendar cells for each day. Using the current date, I'm also adding an active class to the cell representing the current day. The cells are easily displayed in a grid in the UI using the CSS display grid property. Finally, all this dynamic content is added directly in the DOM using the inner HTML approach. Whenever the date changes in the calendar, we'll make sure to notify all the subscribers of the on date change object. In a second, we'll subscribe to this object in the header and update its labels accordingly. Before that, however, let's add the logic to the header buttons. Whenever the user will click on the today button, we'll simply update the calendar to display the current date. When the nav buttons are pressed, First, we'll get a direction based on the button's data attribute. Then, we'll simply add or subtract a month from the current date and set that as the new value in the calendar. Back in the calendar.js file, we'll provide an implementation for the setDate function we defined in the store. We could go into a lot of details here, since, conceptually, this is probably not the best way to structure this code. The setDate function is logically linked to the calendar, so, to provide a predictable API, the method should have been linked to the calendar instance. In this case, however, it's just easier to define it in the state object 
object since we agree this is the shared space which can be accessed from anywhere in the app. I am mentioning this scenario to outline ideas and different ways to solve the same problem in real projects. There are proven solutions to known problems provided by design patterns for instance, but in a lot of scenarios you'll need to find a trade-off between development speed and code cleanliness. In real projects you are most likely tied to a fixed deadline or you have a strict budget, so you can't always afford the time to come up with the most architecturally correct solution. So always aim to write the best code possible, but understand that this will not always be possible when working on real projects. Back to our app, I'm creating a basic translation file to display the month name. This is, yet again, one of those problems which was successfully solved in all popular frameworks. Just keep in mind that it is a good practice to consider that your app will be used by a very diverse group of people, so multi-language support, accessibility and other details such as these really matter. With the basic calendar in place, let's add some logic to allow users to create events for any day in the month. We are doing this in the event modelgs file. You should already know the basics by now. I'm defining an HTML template and appending it to the root app element. We'll just support an event name and we are providing a save and a cancel button. We'll need to do some interactions with the DOM, so I prefer to cache all the element references locally for later usage. This is a good approach since the query selector performance decreases over time if your DOM structure grows in complexity. Keep in mind though that the cached elements will have stale references if the root app content is changed using the inner HTML attribute. This is why I'm always using the insert adjacent HTML method instead. With the DOM elements cached, let's attach some event handlers for the two modal buttons and our input field. Whenever the user presses enter in the input field, I want to trigger the save logic, perform the update and close the modal. The same thing should happen, of course, if the user clicks on the save button. The show event modal function will be called when the user clicks on the calendar cell. In here, we'll update the label showing the date we picked and then changing the element display styling rule to block. It's always nice to think about small UX improvements, so we'll also autofocus the input when the model is opened, since most likely this is what the user will want. JavaScript is a functional language and functions are first-class citizens. This means it is extremely common to pass behavior between components as functions. We are doing just that to perform the save and we are going to execute the code received as a callback from the calendar. As an FYI, the CSS behind the model is straightforward. We are simply using the position fix rule to render the modal element in the center of our page. I am then calling the init event modal function in our main app file and now we can jump back into the calendar and trigger the opening of the modal. For efficiency purposes, I am going to attach only one click event handler on the actual calendar wrapper. Then, inside the handler function, using some basic logic, I'll identify the cell we clicked on. This is the more efficient approach compared to the alternative of registering a click handler on each cell individually. Always try to think of optimized ways to implement your ideas, but keep in mind that your code still needs to be easily understandable. If your code is extremely performant but you are the only one understanding it, you will actually end up losing in the long run. So, when you click on a calendar cell, the show modal function is being called. Then, then, when the user wants to save the event, the callback we are passing over will be executed. We'll store the events in our state object in a simple object literal structure. The events object will have a string composed of the year, month and date as a key and an array of strings as the value. In the update view method of the calendar file, we can then iterate over the list of events, identify based on the key which are the events associated with the current date and then simply render those events into the DOM. I am converting the event strings to list elements using the map function and then I am making sure to correctly join the resulting array into a final string. And this wraps up all the heavy lifting we needed to do to have a basic calendar in place. One final thing we need to work on before wrapping things up is a drag and drop functionality that allows users to move events between different dates. But before doing that, let's quickly persist the events in the local storage. The idea here is that we are currently keeping the events in memory. This means that whenever we are refreshing the browser, all that information is lost. Of of course, in a real project you'd have some sort of REST API or a backend as a service ready to persist and serve your data. In our case however, we'll make use of a nice little feature available in all browsers called local storage. We'll solve this easily. Whenever the page is being closed, data is stored locally. Then, when the app is reloaded, the state.js file is executed and we fetch the information from the storage in the get stored events function. Okay. So this sums it up. Now is the time to work on something a bit more complex and implement some drag and drop capabilities. First, however, I want to mention that this is purely for exercise purposes. I really advise you to use an existing drag and drop library for your real project, since this feature has quite a lot of corner case scenarios and workflows you need to think about. Things such as touch events versus click events, performance and an intuitive API are already solved by smart people, so there is no need for you to reinvent the wheel. Okay. So we listen for three specific mouse events, mouse down, mouse up and mouse move. Then in a local is moving variable, we'll keep track of the current movement state. 
When the user clicks down on an event, the isMove value will be set to true. Then, while moving, the mouse move listener will be executed. When the user releases the click, the movement interaction stops and we'll do some DOM checks to see where exactly in the DOM the mouse click was released. The active event being moved will receive a moving class name, which will apply some CSS rules and position the element absolutely to allow it to be moved freely in the page. In the mouse move event handler, when moving around, we are keeping track of the last calendar cell the user placed the mouse on top of. This will help us when the drag and drop interaction is ended and we'll be able to figure out which is the drop zone or, in other words, which is the new calendar cell receiving the dropped event. Of course, the whole idea here is that when the moving action is started, the event should follow your mouse pointer around. We'll do this by updating the element's top and left CSS rules and assigning them the mouse pointer X and Y coordinates. When the user releases the click, we'll stop the moving process, we'll remove the moving class from the active event, we'll reset its top and left styles and then we'll perform the move to the new cell if necessary. The transfer action should be intuitive. We are getting the unique key based on the year, month and date for the new column cell and then we are updating the two arrays associated with the previous and the current cell. Since we made these changes in the state object, it's enough for us to call the updateView method which will regenerate the entire month view. This is not the most efficient approach. It would have been better from a performance standpoint to simply update the DOM elements associated with the two cells instead of generating the entire 31 cells. This is however a pragmatic decision I'm making and I'm choosing simplicity and a cleaner code base since the overhead of regenerating the entire view is not that large. You are also seeing me installing Prettier. This is a nice little tool you should have present in all your projects regardless of the size. With minimal effort, Prettier will make sure your code looks good and follows some of the best standards. And this pretty much sums it up. This is a new video format I'm experimenting with, where I'm tackling more hands-on projects. Your feedback about the pace, quality or any other aspects is greatly appreciated. Also, please consider liking this video and subscribing to the channel to give me a boost in the YouTube algorithm. Thank you for watching.